Hi everyone, this is Dr. Elena Villanueva and I want to welcome you back today to today's episode of the Tribe Talk podcast. And I have a really great friend and a dear colleague and a mentor of mine who is back to join us. Dr. Tom O'Brien, thank you for coming on today. We've got a really interesting topic that we're gonna be talking about. Yes, yes, thank you. It's always a pleasure to um, interact with you. We, we, we do this dance together that's easy, and uh, hopefully the listeners will get more uh, useful information out of our interactions. Thank you so much. And you know what? I, I totally agree with that. I feel like people can see our resonance or feel our resonance and see our passion and just see, you know, that that when we have something to share, it's it's really coming from our heart um, and our knowledge as doctors and scientists and researchers as well. Um, and 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 with that said, you know, we do have so much to share. Today we're going to be talking about um, the dangers of the gluten-free diet. Now, while many of you are listening, uh, you might be going, what on earth are you guys going to be talking about today? You know, I know that gluten's bad and that we shouldn't be eating it. So what are you going to be talking about with this danger of a gluten-free diet? Well, we're going to be heading right into that right away. Um, Dr. Tom, before we jump into the specifics of that, where do you want to start in this topic this morning? Ah, well, probably. Probably some people, many people are aware that they feel better when they eliminate wheat from their diet, but some people may be asking, well, how come, how come it, why is it so many people that seem to have a problem with wheat? So let's start there. Your, Mrs. Patient, your body is exactly the same as our ancestors thousands of years ago. We have the same kidneys, the same gallbladder, the same eyes the same immune system, we have, everything's the same. We use our brains more, so we've developed creature comfort like housing and the ability to produce food all year around, but we have the same bodies. Our ancestors, when they were looking for food before agriculture, so this is before 10,000 years ago, they, they were nomads, they followed herds, they were constantly looking for food. It was the number one, first was safety, how um, finding a cave or protection from the elements, uh, then it's food. So if they find something, the first thing they do is they snip it, then they nibble at it, make sure it didn't taste bad, the taste buds didn't warn them of a poison, and then they'd eat it. And if there were some bad bugs on the food, uh, but they couldn't, it hadn't made the food rotten yet, so it didn't smell bad, the bugs, if they come out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine, bad bacteria, we have sentries standing guard right there inside the first part of the small intestine, watching all the food that's coming out of the stomach to be absorbed into the body. And those sentries are called toll-like receptor four, you know, a little geeky thing, but, and toll-like receptor four just sits around, it's, it, I think of the guards at Buckingham Palace. You know, those guys that have the red fur hats that are really tall, they, they just stand there stiff as can be. But don't mess with those guys. That's toll-like receptor four in the first part of our small intestine. And its job, there are nine toll-like receptors in the human body. Toll-like receptor four's job is to identify pathological microorganisms bacteria, bad bacteria, bad yeast, things that are going to threaten the survival of the, the body. And when they see something coming out of the stomach that shouldn't be there, means the person ate it and it went down through the stomach, comes into the intestine to be absorbed into the bloodstream, and they see something, they get activated immediately. And two things happen. First, they activate a protein called zonulin, which is the mechanism of what we all have heard of, leaky gut. So toll-like receptor four activates leaky gut because of a threat. Why? Because when you get leaky gut, more water comes into the intestines to wash out the bug with the poop. 
So that's the purpose of leaky gut. It's not bad for you. Excessive leaky gut is bad for you. So first it activates that protein for leaky gut. And the second thing it does is it activates NF-kappa B, the major amplifier of inflammation. So anytime a bug comes out of the stomach, a microorganism, a, a threatening yeast, toll-like receptor 4 gets activated. Here comes the water like like if you've got mud on your driveway, you turn on your garden hose and it doesn't wash off. You put your thumb over the opening of the garden hose. You get a stronger spray to loosen that stuff. That's what leaky gut is for, is to wash out the threat. And you get inflammation in your intestines. That's a good thing. The problem is, and researchers at Harvard have shown us this, and this, this is after reviewing 64, I think, maybe 67. I don't remember the number but studies on this topic, every human, when they eat wheat, wheat activates toll-like receptor four. So wheat is misinterpreted as a harmful component of a bug, of a, of a microorganism. And so this happens in every human without exception. So if you are human, and listening to this, now your wife may not think you're human sometimes, but if you are, when you eat wheat, for every human, it activates toll-like receptor four, here comes leaky gut, and le leaky gut is the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. So that's why wheat is a problem. Whether you feel it or not, when you eat it, you don't feel leaky gut. I mean, the Lucky ones are the ones when you eat something, you feel bad afterwards, then you know. And then if you're gonna keep eating it, well, it's up to you, you, know, you do, do what you want. But the unlucky ones are the ones that don't get any symptoms when they eat wheat in their gut. Well, I feel fine when I eat pizza. Well, okay, but you know that seizure you had yesterday or you know the migraine that comes the day after you eat wheat or the skin that's getting drier and drier or the liver that's not detoxing the alcohol and you got a hangover the next day, that may be the manifestation because the ratio is eight to one. For every one person that gets gut symptoms with a wheat reaction, there are eight that don't. They get heart, brain, liver, kidney, skin symptoms, joint symptoms. So the ratio is eight to one. So that's why wheat is a problem for everyone. Now, should everyone give up wheat? I never say that because then I sound like a nutcase. But everyone that has a health problem of any kind should be checked accurately to see, is your immune system fighting wheat? If it is, then you must give it up because it's creating inflammation that is the number one cause of death. 14 of the top 15 causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. Stop throwing gasoline on the fire is the ratio or is the moniker to live by you know live a more anti-inflammatory lifestyle so that's why wheat is a problem and we could spend an hour just talking about that uh, but if you can accept that for now whether you feel it or not you know when you read the science it's extremely clear that this happens in every human i'll pause there that's fascinating you know so I want to back up to something that you just said. I want to make sure that I heard that right. You said that 14 out of 15 deaths are inflammatory, are from inflammatory related conditions and diseases. That came from the Center for Disease Control two years ago. 14 of the 15 top causes of death in the US are chronic inflammatory diseases. The only one that is not is unintentional injuries, accidents. Everything else is a chronic inflammatory disease. That's why it's so critical that people understand that because that's a big picture view. And when you have a big picture view, you start asking different questions about your health. You know, is this inflammatory or anti-inflammatory for me? Is going to be a line of thinking that you're going to ask more often when you want to increase the health of you and your loved ones. You know, that's so true and so important. As a matter of fact, 
um, you're familiar with my um, inflammation series and on on part one we we spend time going into food and the science behind it and showing how you know showing the inflammation that's caused from certain foods including wheat and the gluten that's in the wheat and dairy and other things that ultimately lead to symptoms conditions and diseases that people are struggling with um now well, one thing I, I i i i would just tweak one thing it doesn't lead to the conditions, it's feeding the conditions. So that's a difference, uh, that it's feeding it, whether you feel it or not. Your cancer is being fed by inflammation. Your plugging up of your pipes in cardiovascular disease is being fed by inflammation. I love that meticulous rewording. Thank you for that. Um, now, I want to go on to something else. We're talking about we're talking about how wheat does it activates these TO4 receptors leading to inflammation and this chronic inflammation. We're talking about this. What type of testing for those listening? What type of testing is available that people can ask their holistic practitioners for if they're wanting to confirm that this is a problem for them? Oh, that's a great question because it's been a huge problem for doctors for many, many years because doctors are not laboratory scientists. They use labs to get test results so they can determine what to do for their patients, but they're not scientists, so they don't think about this. But the testing has been notoriously inaccurate. Um, forever, forever, because the technology was um, limited. And so you do a blood test and you, well, there's the results. Yeah, but this test is wrong three out of 10 times. You, you know, when, when you look at, it's called sensitivity and specificity. Most of the tests out there are in the 70s to low 80s in, seven, in sensitivity and specificity, but we never think about that because there are no other options. But, you know, I like to use this example. If, if I knew you 30 years ago and I said, you know, within 30 years, I'm going to be holding like a little black thing in my hand about the size of my wallet. And if I push on it and if I push and scroll and, you know, just push a couple of buttons, uh, uh, I can tell you within five seconds that the air particulate matter in Spiazzo, Italy today is nine. It's really good. And in Chicago, it's 32. That's still in the green zone. You're okay. But San Antonio is at 84. This is not a good day to go outside running in San Antonio. I can tell you that within five seconds. I've got the entire encyclopedia of the world in my hand, and I can pull up anything in 5, 10, 15 seconds, anything I want to know. If I had told you that 30 years ago, you would have thought I was watching too much Star Trek. Right? Well, technology improves. And the technology of the laboratory tests that most doctors have access to, because uh, hospitals are so sluggish in, in upgrading, um, is the technology of the 1980s and the 1990s. They're good tests, but their sensitivity and specificity is limited. In January of 2016, the first paper came out from Mayo Clinic, published in a medical journal saying, there's a new era in laboratory medicine that has just dawned. And the technology now called silicone chip technology is so good, it's 97 to 99% sensitive and 98 to 100% specific, which means it's right on the money every single time. So, Never before have doctors had access to tests like these before. Now, when you do a test using silicone chip technology, you get the right answer so that you don't get false negatives or false positives. You get the right answer. And um, in testing for wheat, the test is called the wheat zoomer because you zoom in on the problem. And there's, you know, I just came back from a seven week trip to Europe, and um, I lectured in a couple of lectures in Dublin, three in London, Milan, 
uh, Switzerland, Poland. And at the breaks, I always go down to the vendor booths and look at the laboratories and I look at their catalogs to see what kind of testing they've got. And I can tell you, these are the best tests in the world. It's not a flippant statement. There is nothing anywhere. I don't know about China. I've not gone to China. But uh, in, in the Western world, no one has any tests that are anywhere near these quality tests. The zoomers, there's a wheat zoomer, there's a corn zoomer, a dairy zoomer. <laughs> and you look at these tests and now you can be confident that these tests are right on the money. And I always tell patients, go to my website, the dr.com and look up the wheat zoomer test and download the information and take it to your doctor and say, hey, would you please order this test for me? It's like the most accurate test that's available. And if they won't do it, most doctors won't do something new like that. You know, they need to put their toe in the water before they dive in. Uh, if they won't do it, you can order the test on my site and we'll send you the test kits to do. But I always want the doctors to learn more. But it's the wheat zoomer. That is the best test in the world. You know, um, I'm total, I'm in total agreement with what you're saying. You know, it was fascinating when I was finally exposed to this new technology and testing. Um, and, uh, and I actually, I, I actually have taught um, for the company um, that is doing this type of testing. And uh, I've been really honored to be able to get on stages and start teaching. Um, when while I haven't taught about the wheat zoomer, I've been teaching about some of the other toxin tests and how we're using them uh, to help people to teach people how to identify their barriers to healing so that they can be proactive about removing those. And um, um, and I was so excited when I found out that you were teaching over in Europe, that you were traveling around. I can't wait to get up on stage and be teaching with you or alongside you or just you know getting to go and do That's that. I have the same passion that you have for educating people and teaching people how to become active participants in reclaiming their own healing. And so this just so inspiring to hear that your message is reaching people across the Western world, um, you know, that you get to get on stages and teach about all of the things that you're doing. Yes, yes, thank you. It's a real honor. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, you know, because people really appreciate getting the information, the most current information from the states, you know, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and we're uh, helping a lot of people in doing that. You absolutely are helping a lot of people. Um, that's one of the things I love about you. And that's why I have you back on my podcast and would like to have you back even with more frequency because there's so much valuable information. Um, now, jumping back into this, you know, we've talked about the dangers of wheat and you've given us some scientific background, explaining it in a very easy way for all the listeners to understand. And we've even gone into showing our, or, you know, uh, educating our listeners as to uh, what tests are available that can actually help quantify it for their human mind to really be able to see for a fact that it is indeed causing a problem in their body, even if they're one of those people that are unfortunately not noticing it directly. Now, that would lead us all to assume that a gluten-free diet is the way to go. But you're saying that a gluten-free diet might actually be dangerous for us. Can you kind of give us some, some un, a better understanding of what that means exactly? You bet. You bet. And this is such a shocker for people uh, and doctors. Doctors go, what? When I show the study after study after study, they go, I, I didn't know this. Because people feel better on a gluten-free diet almost all the time, almost all the time. Within a couple of weeks, you know, their belt has gone down one notch. You know, they're losing that bad fat around their midsection. Their spare tire is getting smaller. Uh, their energy is up. Their sleeping is better. Their brain fog is lifting their joint pains are less, wherever their vulnerability is, where that inflammation has been causing a problem, 
going on a gluten-free diet often makes a noticeable difference and you start feeling better. And it happens pretty quickly, uh, usually within three weeks. If people aren't noticing a benefit within three weeks, we go back and reevaluate. What did we miss, right? So you're feeling better, your headaches are less, your seizures are less, your energy's up, whatever your symptoms are, you think everything's great. Well, but there's a problem. Um, and the, I'll tell you the problem in a minute. There's a couple of problems, but the result of these problems is that when you diagnose someone with celiac disease, which is one of the manifestations of a wheat problem, by far not the only one and not the most frequent one by, by any means, but the one that everybody's heard about, when you diagnose someone with celiac disease, their likelihood of dying within the first year is 86% higher from a cardiovascular incident. Let me tell you the whole thing so that it makes sense. They looked at 350,000 people that were sent to gastroenterologists to something's wrong in their gut and they had endoscopy and biopsy. It's the test where they send a tube down uh, into your intestines and there's a little camera and they're looking around in there and they have a little scissors uh, inside the tube uh, and they snip a little piece of intestines, take it out and look at it under a microscope. It's called an endoscopy and biopsy. 350,000 people, they found 39,000 celiacs. The rest of the people, they had Crohn's disease or uh, ulcerative colitis or uh, some other problem of their gut, uh, but they, they didn't have celiac disease. And some were normal. There was no problem that they could identify. There was some other reason for their symptoms, but there's 350,000 people with gut symptoms, 39,000 celiacs. If you were diagnosed with celiac disease, you had an 86% increased risk of dying within one year of a cardiovascular incident compared to the other 300,000 people that did not get a diagnosis of celiac disease. And you had a 387% chance of dying within the first year of a cancer compared to the people that were not diagnosed with celiac disease. And that's like, what? Wow. What? And there are many other numbers um, about that topic that just keep dropping your jaw. And if I were talking to doctors, I would probably take about, about 10 to 15 minutes, you know, maybe seven to 10 minutes, just showing one study after another study after another study, and the difference between men and women and children. You know, children, the average age of a child diagnosed with celiac disease of when they die is 38. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's horrible. These statistics are horrible. And so what happens? Now, this is just from a diagnosis of celiac disease. Not any treatments that were given, no drugs that were given, not a side reaction to a drug, like when you have high blood pressure, they give you high blood pressure medication. They don't give you celiac medication. There is none. But what do they do? They put you on a gluten-free diet. What else do they do? Nothing. That's the problem. So that's the result that occurs for a lot of people. And that increased risk of dying, the numbers go down a little bit every year that you survive until if you make it 25 years, then there's no increased risk of dying compared to the other 300,000 people. Uh, but it, it continues for 20 to 25 years of a higher risk of dying from something. So why? The million dollar question is why? For that, we have to do some background information first. When people ask me, I'm only gonna do one thing. What's the one thing I can do to be healthier? The one thing, should I take vitamin C? Should I eat a paleo diet? What's the one thing that I should learn and do? And there's no argument if you read the science, the most impactful thing you can do is to rebuild a healthier, diverse microbiome. 
the good guys in your gut, because the, the, the microbiome, uh, that's the, the good guys, the bad guys, the bacteria, the yeast, the viruses, the bugs that are in your gut, they, and the word is modulate, it's a good Scrabble word, but what it means is, has its hands on the steering wheel of how your body's going. For example, for every one message from the brain going down telling the gut what to do, there are nine messages from the gut going up telling the brain what to do. And those messages occur through a couple of different ways, but one way is that, you know, the papers came out in 2012, I think it was, they showed that 36% of all the small molecules in your bloodstream are the exhaust of the bacteria in your gut. So one third, you know, like if I exercise and I'm pumping weights and the next day I'm sore, I'm sore because of lactic acid. Everybody's heard of lactic acid. It's the exhaust of your muscle cells when they work. Your bacteria make exhaust. It's called the metabolites, right? So one third of all the small molecules in your bloodstream are the metabolites of the microbiome. What? Why? <laughs> because they're the messengers going up telling the brain what to do, going over telling the heart what to do, how, how frequently to beat, how hard the muscle should work so that, and that, that stimulates your blood pressure. Um, the list goes on and on of what the metabolites of the gut, how they direct body function. So if there's only one thing you're going to do, it's build a healthy, diverse microbiome. That's most important. Now, when they take healthy people and they check their microbiome, how many good guys do they have? How many bad guys? How much diversity do they have? When they put them on a gluten-free diet, within 30 days, every single person's microbiome has gotten much, much worse. And these are healthy people, much worse. The number of good guys goes down, the number of bad guys goes up, the, the, the percentage diversity goes down within 30 days on a gluten-free diet. That's why, and now, so let's back up. The environment of the gut is sending the messages throughout your body to modulate how your body functions, now you go on a gluten-free diet and you change the environment of the gut so that now you've got the amount of good guys go down, the amount of bad guys go up. They're producing exhaust, but now more of the exhaust is inflammatory to the body. But you don't feel that. So in the first 30 days, first 60 days of a gluten-free diet, you're losing the spare tire, your belt's coming a notch tighter, you know, your energy's up, your headaches are gone, your child's seizures are less, you feel great, thank God, for the gluten-free diet. But eight months down the road, now you've been producing so much more inflammation because the, the ratio of the good guys to the bad guys in the gut has been changed. Why has it changed? It changes because 78 to 81%, depending on the study you read, 78 to 81 percent of the prebiotics, the foods that feed the good guys in the gut, the prebiotics in our diet come from wheat. Not, er not everything in wheat is bad for you. There's good components of wheat and there's not so good. The, the not so good outweigh the good. But the good components of wheat, one of them are called the arabinoxylans, and they're the prebiotics. And 78 to 81% of the prebiotics in our diet come from wheat. Just think of how often you eat wheat. Toast in the morning, sandwich at lunch, pasta at dinner, or a dinner roll before you start your dinner when you go to a restaurant, croutons on your salad, a cookie. I mean, this is day after day, every day you're eating it. And part of the reason why it's been good for you to do that is because it's feeding the good guys in your gut. It's the food that the good guys use called prebiotics. That's the category of foods. Now, put them on a gluten-free diet and 
Tell them, uh, well, there's gluten-free pasta out there and gluten-free bread. It tastes pretty good. It doesn't taste like cardboard anymore. Sometimes you can't even tell it's gluten-free. The pasta is really good. But the gluten-free foods are just white paste. There's no prebiotic in them. So you're eating this. It kind of feels the same. No, I'm half Italian. I'm going to eat gluten-free pasta once in a while because I like the pasta feeling. I'm just going to do it, but I know how to protect myself when I do. But people are eating gluten-free bread. They're substituting, and they're maintaining the lifestyle they've always had. That's the problem. You have to replace the prebiotics that you lose when you go on a gluten-free diet. That's the primary problem that contributes to the mortality because when you don't give the prebiotics anymore, you're on a gluten-free diet, and you're down to 10% or 20% of the prebiotics that you used to have, because 78 to 81% of the prebiotics in the diet come from wheat, and you take wheat out, so now you've only got you know, 20% left of, of, of your diet that's feeding the good guys, and the good guys start to die off. And when they die off, they're starving to death, when they die off, the bad guys rear their ugly head because the numbers of good guys are so much more in the environment than the bad guys. The bad guys can't get a hold. There's always bad guys in the gut, always. But the numbers of the good guys are so much more. And it's called dominance, that the good guys dominate the environment and they keep the bad guys in check. The good guys are eating the food, uh, that comes in so they can reproduce. The bad guys can't get very much. That's the ideal world. But when you've got a gluten-free diet, the good guys start starving and the bad guys eat other stuff that, that's coming through. So they multiply. That's why eight months, 10 months, a year down the road, you've got an increased risk of death. I mean, that's the end stage, but you get sick and or the guy has a heart attack and dies. And you hear that your patient died of a heart attack. Oh, that's too bad. You know, he was really working on it. And he, he changed his whole life when he went gluten-free. And he lost 20 pounds. And he was much happier. And that's too bad he had a heart attack. No, the gluten-free diet likely contributed to that. Right? So that's the arena that we have to educate all of our doctors in and our patients that are gluten-free. You have to replace the prebiotics that you remove when you go on a gluten-free diet. That's fascinating information. And I feel like that's so important for people to understand. Now, we've just explained some really important information to our listeners, but let's take it a step further and let's talk about how we replace or continue to put in these healthy prebiotics, leaving out the toxic gluten component. What do we do to put those prebiotics back into our bodies? Really important question. And, you know, and always want to um, uh, make sure to give people the steps to do and not just scream woof, right? Yeah, okay. So first, Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping and buy your fruits and vegetables, and it's really important to do organic now more than ever before in history. Uh, maybe we'll do a show on that. Uh, but uh, buy a couple of every root vegetable they have, always organic, but buy root vegetables. Get rutabagas and turnips and parsnips and radishes and carrots and sweet potatoes. Not too many white potatoes because of the glycemic problem with those. A few is okay, but don't focus on those. And every day you have one root vegetable. Well, and you'll say, well, I don't know what to do with the turnip. Well, neither do I. So what I do is I uh, dice a turnip up, I uh, slice an onion, peel some garlic, a little coconut oil or avocado oil in the pan, saute it all up together. Maybe I throw some spices on it or I pour some sauce on it and I eat it. I say, okay, but what about parsnips? I dice them up, slice an onion, peel some garlic, and I do the same thing, put a little sauce on it and I eat it. You don't have to be Julia Child here. Uh, you know, you just need to get it down because the root vegetables, the fiber in the root vegetables feed the good bacteria in your gut. Now, you don't want to just eat carrots. 
because every root vegetable has different fibers that feed different families of the good bacteria in your gut. So you want to alternate the root vegetables you're eating. That's the first thing you do. Next, you go on Google and you type in list of prebiotic foods. And you print it out and you put it on your refrigerator. And every day you have two from the list. So you're going to learn that a banana is a prebiotic that onions, that garlic are prebiotics, and they feed different bacteria than the root vegetables do, right? And so you have one root vegetable and two from the list every day, every meal, if you can, but certainly at least every day. And we've all gone to restaurants, fancy restaurants where they shave a radish raw and they put it on your salad. You say, oh, that's a radish. I don't like radishes, but they, oh, that's pretty good with a little salad dressing, right? So you'll find ways of making sure your family's getting root vegetables every day. Next, when you go shopping to buy your food, always organic, buy 15, 20 apples. Wash them when you get home, but don't peel them. Slice them up, uh, get, the, get rid of the seeds, put them in a pot. And if the apples are this high in the pot, you add one third the height of the apples with of water. So add water to about one third the height of the apples in the pot. Put a little cinnamon in there, maybe a couple of raisins if you have kids. Turn it on high. In 12 to 15 minutes, you got applesauce. That's how easy it is. Now my wife then takes it and she puts it in the blender to blend it up so it's really creamy. I like it a little more chunky, you know, but you know, but either way is okay. This is, there's a reason why an apple a day keeps the doctor away. There's a reason for that saying, because it's true. Apples, the pectin in apples feed, uh, the most important enzyme in your gut, arguably, is called intestinal alkaline phosphatase. And it protects the good guys, the good bacteria in your gut. It fights the bad guys. It lowers cholesterol, lowers triglycerides, increases insulin sensitivity, doesn't allow the bad bugs called LPS to get into the bloodstream. So it reduces endotoxin. All of these things happen by intestinal alkaline phosphatase. And you have a tablespoon a day of freshly made applesauce. If you want, you, you, you can have more, but at least a tablespoon a day and over time, you're feeding the good bacteria, um, I'm sorry, you're feeding intestinal alkaline phosphatase and then the good bacteria in your gut. Next, Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping, get five different types of fermented vegetables. Get sauerkraut, kimchi, fermented beets, curry flavored, whatever you like. We get five different types every day and you work up to having a tablespoon every day of a fermented vegetable because what ferments the vegetables is the process, the fermentation process makes the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so you're inoculating yourself with the good bacteria, much more comprehensive than taking pills of uh, good bacteria called probiotics much more comprehensive to eat fermented vegetables every day. And you work, some people don't like it. Well, hide it in your soup. You, you don't have to taste it. Um, uh, you, you don't need to get the, and for those with the histamine sensitivity, you don't let your taste buds recognize that it's there, hide it. Hide it in your soup is a good place to go. And those with a histamine sensitivity, you just start with a little bit of juice from the bottle and put it in a cup of tea. You don't have to taste it. You just want the good bacteria, those good bugs in the juice, in the fermented vegetables down there. And when you do that, a tablespoon a day, you increase the inoculation of good bacteria in your gut 10,000 fold. When you read the science, it's like, whoa, that's powerful. So over time, it's these lifestyle habits that will help. Next, Mrs. Patient, every day if you can, or every few days, have a cup of organic bone broth. Learn how to make your own, it's really simple and easy, but bone broth is high in gelatin tannate. 
Gelatin tannate is a band-aid, uh, a gauze pad over a leaky gut. And so that it protects the leaky gut damaged tissue so that it can heal faster. Just imagine, you know, you're slot playing with your kids and you fall down and you get, you slide a little on the carpet, you get a carpet burn on your knee, right? You don't put your pants on for a day or two. You wear shorts if you can, depending on the season, because, you know, it's sensitive. You know, you, you got a carpet burn. Okay, well, that's what leaky gut is inside your gut. It's a carpet burn. And so if you can put a gauze pad over the inside of the gut where it's <clears> damaged, <throat> it's going to heal much faster. And bone broth will do that. And when you start a gluten-free diet for a couple of months, we like people to take three supplements, three different supplements. And, but and then you're, you're um, changing your lifestyle so that you don't need the supplements long-term, uh, but at least for a couple of months. The first one is a prebiotic supplement. Uh, there are many good ones out there uh, that you can find. We like one called Mega prebiotic, but there are many different ones out there. Next is a supplement of the probiotics, the good bacteria. And most doctors recommend probiotics and they have patients take them forever. No, 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 no. Uh, you want people to inoculate and develop the lifestyle to where every day they're inoculating with the good bacteria. Uh, but for a couple of months, when you go gluten-free so that you're not starving the good bacteria that's there right now, you take a supplement. We like the supplements that are called, uh, spores, called Megaspore. They get really good results, but there are many good supplements out there. Next, colostrum. Colostrum is mother nature's way of supporting the microbiome, building a healthy microbiome. Every newborn baby has severe intestinal permeability. It's normal when they're in the womb. They're really permeable. And it's colostrum, the first three days of mother's milk. It's not milk, it's colostrum. And the first three day, three to five days, it's, it's, it sends the messages down <clears throat> that talks to the genes in the gut that says, time to close those tight junctions now, no more leaky gut, because food's going to be coming pretty soon. And so colostrum activates building a healthier gut and a healthier microbiome. And so for a couple of months, we have our patients taking colostrum. And for those that have a dairy sensitivity, and many do, uh, we say, Mrs. Patient, we just found out you have a dairy sensitivity. Get all the dairy out of there. You know, stop the cheese, everything. But for a couple of months, I'd like you to try the colostrum. You know, try it and see. It's a little bit of an investment. You know, try it to see. Uh, but if you don't have any symptoms when you take the colostrum, Take it for a couple of months because nothing is more powerful. It is the most powerful substance to create a healthy gut in nature, the most powerful. And if you have some symptoms like bloating or gas or diarrhea, just stop the colostrum. Well, it's worth a try. Give it to somebody else in the family, yeah. right? But, it, but it's worth a try. So you take three supplements, a prebiotic, a probiotic, and colostrum for a couple of months while you're transitioning into this healthier way of eating and the the result is you don't lose the good guys in your gut, which is the target goal when you go gluten free. You know, that's the same. That's a that's the same protocol that we use. And we've actually never seen anyone so far. We've never seen anyone who had a dairy allergy or a dairy sensitivity react to colostrum. So like I like to make an analogy similar to what you made with the wheat. You know, not all components of the wheat are bad. Um, it's the gluten part of the wheat that's bad. The same thing with the colostrum, like the colostrum doesn't carry the components of dairy that are that typically make people sick and give people all the inflammation. And, you know, the colostrum, much like you said, I like to also use the analogy of like, you know, that's the very, very first thing that, you know, by design, by divine design, um, that is given to a newborn baby, a, a newborn human baby and other mammals. And why is that? Like we're, it's, it's so perfect. We're so perfectly designed, you know, that's so important because the baby needs that. It, it, like you said, it's programming 
the human body for optimization of the immune system, absorption of nutrients, you know, optimizing and opening the door for all of the all of the brain growth, all the neuron growth that's getting ready to happen in the first couple of years of that of that newborn's life. And without colostrum, you know, the the mammal when it's born, whether it's a human or an animal mammal, is going to have a lot of compromise to many different systemic engines in the body. Colostrum is just a wonderful option for gut healing. I fully agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much. You know, there was so much great information in here. Um, I think that not only are we going to um, publish this on our podcast channel, um, I think we're going to go ahead and add this. I think this is just such a great value add. I'm, we're going to add this um, into our program for our, our clients um, mm. because this discussion was just so candid and it was so good. And, uh, and, and I think that this is just a really, really good reinforcement of the messages that we're giving to our clients as well to get to hear it from you also. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you've got a really great um, um, program coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You bet, you bet. Uh, one of the most difficult things for people is uh, when they learn about the dangers of wheat and they do a wheat zoomer test and they see their immune system is fighting wheat, whether they feel it or not, and they understand the long-term complications of that dynamic, they understand the importance of going gluten-free. And arguably the most difficult thing is going gluten-free in a healthy way. That it's not easy and it's a trial and error. You fall down on your face a lot. You get a lot of carpet burns. You get a lot of gut burns uh, as a result of you're trying your best. And so we've got a 30 day program um, to walk people through. Uh, all right, here's how you do it. You're gonna take next 30 days and you're gonna learn a little bit every day and then you've got it down for the rest of your life for you and your family. So the gluten-free masterclass uh, is a step-by-step -step and um, uh, one of our certified gluten-free practitioners, uh, uh, Jenny, who's a certified nutritionist also, uh, she and I do this together. And you know, she's got um, her finger on the pulse. You know, she's a younger person. She's I think, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say her age, but it's um, uh, much younger than me, right? So she talks in the language of the current generation that's having babies and children. And, uh, and with the things that I, I would never think to say that, oh, that, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, but the result is it's much more impactful than you get an elder guy like me trying to teach a 26 year old woman um, how to live a gluten-free life. You know, I can talk to science all day, but there's, um, a, Jenny wrote a book and I wrote the forward to her book, which is how we met each other. And uh, her book is Dear Gluten, It's You, Not Me. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, it's like you see these movies of uh, young women that realize that he's a jerk right? And they find their power. You know, they, they go to Italy and they find their power. I, I don't know the name of the movies, but, but Jenny talks the language of taking ownership for yourself, of being healthier for you and your children and your family. And she does it in a great way. So it's funny. We have lots of laughs uh, uh, every day uh, in the instructional videos. And it's like, oh, I didn't know that. That's a great way of saying it. And she just smiles and says, well, thank you, Dr. Brian. And then, I mean, she has a great way of uh, re, re saying what I've said in everyday language, because I get a little geeky at times, but it's fun. And the feedback is just excellent. Excellent. People love this. And they're now successful in implementing the gluten-free diet. This 30-day program, give me a month. Give me a month of your life just a little bit of time and the result will be, you won't be one of those statistics of a year down the road, two years, five years, your increased risk of mortality is gone. As far as we know, completely gone when you've gone through and implemented this program. I love that. And you know, just a few, a few closing thoughts. Um, I love the concept 
of having different generations to be able to meet the different generations where they're at with uh, with the with the way that they communicate. The first time that I heard of that um, of that concept being used was with my father, who was a physician, and he had a very large um, ophthalmology practice down in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and he started out; it was just him. Then he brought in a partner who was his age, and then he had this epiphany at some point during his practice as as it was growing. Um, it it grew very very big back in the eighties, um, and uh, and he ended up bringing in physicians, other eye doctors, um, for each generation, mm. and it was fascinating. And the the patients as they would come in, they would get fed to the doctor in their generation, oh, and it was a beautiful concept that worked so so well. In fact, I've adopted that with our practice. We have we have different, we have four generations in our practice right now. Um, and we all can explain things just from a little different perspective, using a little different language, depending on the, you know, the way that we were raised, you know, the language and the phrases that we use are a little bit different, but it does help the patients or the clients to connect with the person who's trying to teach them how to heal. So I, I love that's hearing, great. I love hearing yeah. that with you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because sometimes people don't laugh at my jokes, but they're always younger than me and they don't know <laughs> who Marcus Welby was. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, it's like it, it's over their head. I'll it's use analogies. Head, right? I'll use analogies sometimes that people people just don't get. And I'm like, OK, well, yeah, I'm a little bit older than they are. So yeah. you know, they don't they don't remember that time. Right. Well, um, your father was ahead of his time and brilliant at what, at what he did. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I wish you would have had an opportunity to know him. Um, one more thing before we go. Um, this class that you're offering, can you give us some information on where our listeners can find the information on this class? And I'll be sure for all of you listening that I include a link here for you as well so that you can have a physical link. But where where can people find out about this class so they can register for it? Oh, oh thank you so much. Uh, at the dr.com, the doctor.com, just don't spell the word doctor out. And we will make sure that you have a link also that you, you can use um, post on this podcast. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tom. And thank you for you know, all of you tuning in today. Thank you again for joining the Tribe Talk podcast and hanging out with us and listening to what we have to say. I hope that you learned something new today. I hope that you got inspired. And I look forward to you continuing to join us on our future Tribe Talk podcast. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next one.